pollen count was a beautiful day, but the pollen count was through the roof today. And so um, I barely made it through uh, the midweek Lenten sermon today because uh, I just kept kind of choking and coughing. So if I have to take frequent water breaks or more frequent than usual, I hope you'll uh, forgive me. Uh, it's just my allergies. All right, now, uh, as we prepare to go into Luke 13, verse 10, I want to remind you of several things. First of all, this section that we're going into, Luke 13, 10 to 35, is all about the reversals. Remember, uh, the, one of the great themes of Luke's gospel is the great reversal, that God's kingdom is different from the kingdoms of this world. The lowly are lifted up, the howdy and high are pushed down, um, and so on and so forth. Humility is uh, uh, a characteristic of the greatest in, um, in this gospel. It's present in, in the other gospels as well, but you remember with the Magnificat, it is a major theme of this gospel. And so in this section, verses 10 to 35 of Luke 13, we see the reversals brought about by the kingdom of God having come into the world in Jesus. Also, more specifically, verses 10 to 21 talks uh, about, or they, they talk about how the kingdom of God has small beginnings but grows and you'll see what I mean in a minute. One other thing to remind you of is that um, as was true of verses 1 to 9, verses 10 to 17 also are completely unique to Luke's gospel. What Jesus says here uh, does not appear in the other three gospels at all. Hi, Rita and Edith and Ken. I'm glad you're all here too. So now let's dig in here to verses 10 to 17. Now Jesus was teaching in one of the synagogues on the Sabbath, and there was a woman who had had, had a disabling spirit for 18 years. She was bent over and could not fully straighten herself. When Jesus saw her, he called her over and said to her, Woman, you are freed from your disability. And he laid his hands on her, and immediately she was made straight, and she glorified God. But the ruler of the synagogue, indignant because Jesus had healed on the Sabbath, said to the people, There are six days in which work ought to be done. Come on those days and be healed and not on the Sabbath day. Then the Lord answered him, You hypocrites, does not each of you on the Sabbath untie his ox or his donkey from the manger and lead it away to water it? And ought not this woman, a daughter of Abraham, whom Satan bound for eighteen years, be loosed from this bond on a Sabbath day? As he said these things, all his adversaries were put to shame, and all the people rejoiced at all the glorious things that were done by him. So we have Jesus performing a miraculous sign, and then we have him uh, giving a teaching about it. And um, let's just unpack this a little bit now. Hi, Matt and Ruth. Glad you're here as well this evening. This is the last time in the Luke, uh, in the Gospel of Luke, that we're told about Jesus going into a synagogue. On the two previous um, occasions when he performed healings at synagogues, <coughs> each had their own unique emphasis. Let's take a look real quickly. We're not going to read all the way through them, but I want to show you how each of the healings in, performed in the synagogues had their own unique 
uh, indicators. Remember, the miracles are signs. So each of these miraculous signs point to something different. Take a look at Luke 4, 31 to 37. Luke 4, 31 to 37. Here, Jesus um, healed a man who had an unclean demon. We're told at the very beginning of it. Um, I know, let's scroll down. Verse 33. And in the synagogue, there was a man who had the spirit of an unclean demon. And he cried out with a loud voice, Ha! What have you to do with us, Jesus of Nazareth? Have you come to destroy us? I know who you are, the Holy One of God. So here the point is that Jesus has dominion over the demonic. Hi, Pastor Chuck. Hi, Renee. Glad you're on board as well. So that's uh, healing number one in the synagogue, which would have happened on the Sabbath, of course. Then healing number two in a synagogue, according to Luke, appears in Luke chapter 6, verses 6 to 11. Take a look at that if you would. This is a physical healing. This is a man with a withered, a withered hand. And, um, you know, uh, it, we're told early on in verse 7 that the scribes and the Pharisees were watching to see whether he was going to perform a healing on the Sabbath. Like, that's a bad thing, you know. And uh, so he, he takes care of this man with a withered hand. So first was demonic exorcism. The second was a physical healing. Hi there, Stephanie. I'm glad you're here tonight again. Stephanie is the same age as Philip. They were in uh, uh, preschool together. And uh, when, when I was up in uh, Northwest Ohio, when we were there and I was serving Bethlehem at Okolona, I'm glad you're here, Stephanie. Thanks for being here. Now this third uh, Sabbath, healing in a synagogue or miraculous sign has to do with a woman who we're told has a disabling spirit. Now, literally, in the Greek, it says she has a, had a spirit of weakness. There was some physical ailment that she suffered from, but it may have had, uh, because of the way it's expressed, it may have had a spiritual uh, rooting. So first, is a, a, an exorcism, purely an exorcism involving a demonic spirit. The next uh, synagogue healing was for a physical ailment, the man with the withered hand. And the third one here that we have is of a woman um, who has a disabling spirit. So this would seem to indicate that she had a physical ailment that was rooted in spiritual causes. <clears throat> well, that pretty much covers the gamut. This is a good time for me to touch real quickly on uh, a lot of research has been done in recent years um, at places like Harvard and the University of Michigan and elsewhere um, of the effect of prayer on physical ailments. And uh, there have been, I think, something like 400 studies done of this in recent years. And um, there are some good books out there. I will, um, if I can remember it, put the titles and the links in the comments if you're interested. Um, but here we see um, that Jesus has an interest in the whole person. You know, we tend to divide human beings into spirit and mind and all of that. Jesus cares about the whole person. What does Jesus redeem through his cross and resurrection? The whole person. We believe as Christians that at the last day, the dead in Christ will be raised and live in the new heaven and the new earth with Jesus Christ. That's our belief. It's the whole being 
that God cares about. And we see this in these three miraculous signs, Jesus addressing the full gamut or the full range of issues that can bedevil our lives on earth. And ultimately, what they are, uh, they demonstrate or are signs of is that he is the God in the flesh who has the power to overcome these things, which he's going to do um, in Jerusalem with his crucifixion. And this is all happening right now in the course of his journey toward Jerusalem. And it, what's interesting here is there is no indication that the woman asks Jesus for healing. Jesus goes out of his way to bring her healing. She's been um, bent over and could not fully straighten herself um, for 18 years. One thinks of uh, scoliosis or, uh, or other such diseases. She's, she's not able to um, straighten up. Jesus seeks her out and um, he tells her, he proclaims with his words in verse 12 that she's freed from her disability and then he touches her. Now this is fraught with all kinds of important uh, meanings. You remember we've talked before about how Luke is sometimes referred to as the women's gospel. And we talked about how so often an example of something happening to a man is then um, matched later by something happening to a woman or a man proclaiming Jesus and a woman proclaiming Jesus. Now, here we see Jesus uh, going out of his way to heal a woman at the synagogue. Now, at the synagogue, um, the congregation was deliberately segregated. The men were in the inner area, and then there was a kind of screen around the area in which the men gathered for worship. And beyond that screen were the women and the children. And um, this was all part of the Jewish custom of women being second-class citizens. Here is Jesus going out of his way to find this woman and tell her she's healed, and then to touch her, which in some ways would have been regarded as inappropriate. It would have been regarded as inappropriate for a man and a woman to speak in public as well, unless they were related. So Jesus is breaking down these barriers. And Luke tells this story when the other gospel writers don't tell it, which also makes me think of Paul, under whom he served Luke, um, you know, uh, saying in, in Christ there is no male or female slave or free Jew or Gentile. So uh, Jesus goes out of his way. So he scandalizes the synagogue uh, ruler in more than one way. <laughs> Not only does he uh, perpetrate, if I can put it that way, a healing on the Sabbath, huh? but it's for a woman and he touches her. Uh, and the synagogue ruler is utterly offended by this. And it's interesting because in verse 14, the synagogue ruler doesn't bother to address Jesus directly. He doesn't want to talk to Jesus directly. He talks to everyone else in the synagogue. It says uh, in verse 14, the ruler of the synagogue, indignant because Jesus had healed on the Sabbath, said to the people, said to everyone else, this is wrong. He shouldn't be doing this. Uh, and then Jesus gives this great response. And he says, he uses the plural form. He says, you hypocrites. Why? I'm talking about verse 15. Why does he say you hypocrites? Because the ruler is saying it, but other people there in the synagogue are thinking it. This is completely inappropriate. It's a violation of the Sabbath. And that's the big thing that they bring up. But it's a violation of etiquette. And really, they would have regarded it as almost immoral for a man to address a woman who was not related to him in public. So they're scandalized by it. But he 
he keys in on the whole uh, Sabbath question. So he says, you hypocrites, and remember, hupokrites, the word that we transliterate into English as hypocrite, uh, was the Greek word for actor, right? Because uh, an actor pretends to be someone they're not. So Jesus is applying this to the ruler of the synagogue and the others who are there. He's saying, you're pretending to be pious, faithful Jews, but you're not. You're a hypocrite. You're hiding behind a pious mask because you should be rejoicing that this woman has received healing after 18 years. And Jesus uses an interesting um, uh, argument. First of all, the argument is the typical um, uh, Aramaism or Semitic form of argument, which is, if this little thing, how much more this greater thing, right? So he says, each of you would untie uh, your ox or donkey and lead it to the water on Sabbath. Well, that's work, right? Uh, and yet you're upset that this woman has been healed. And he uses interesting and I think very deliberate phrasing. Look what he says in verse 16. And ought not this woman a daughter of Abraham. So to be a child of Abraham is to be, you know, part of the people of God. Shouldn't this woman who is of the people of God, who has the dignity of her ancestor, ancestral father, Abraham, um, ought not this woman, a daughter of Abraham, whom Satan bound for 18 years, be loosed? from this bond on the Sabbath day. The argument is you're more concerned about your donkeys and your oxen than you are about this woman who is a child of Abraham. And shouldn't she receive God's blessings? And shouldn't she receive deliverance from Satan on the Sabbath day? In other words, the, 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 the ruler of the synagogue, and this would apply to many of Jesus' contemporaries, it even applies to some Christians today, have a completely wrong idea of what Sabbath is for. And, uh, of course, Luther keys in on what the Sabbath is for. It's to hear God's word, gladly hear and learn it. Remember, that's what he says in the small catechism. And back in the days when people did back-breaking daily labor, God set aside a day when they could hear God's word. <coughs> and and um, it, it wasn't so much about refraining from labor, all that, though that was part of it. It was refraining from labor in order to be able to connect with God. What we talked about before is that with Jesus' death on the cross, the Sabbath has been unleashed on all of life. What does Jesus say in Matthew? Come to me, you who are weak and heavy laden. In other words, those of you who are under the, the burden that an, an ox is under, you know, uh, yoked in that way. And he says, I will give you rate, uh, rest because my yoke, or my, my burden is light, my yoke. You got the idea. So that's in Matthew. My yoke is light, my burden, I don't know, easy, something like that. But the point is that Jesus liberates uh, us to have Sabbath, in essence, through the whole week. Because we can know that the, the word made flesh directly. What happened when Jesus died on the cross? The curtain was torn in two. The access to God is for us all the time, right? So he's saying you've got a completely wrong idea of the Sabbath. And you're using the Sabbath to prevent God's good from coming to people. And Jesus, through his death and resurrection, unleashes the good that God wants to do on all people. So he tells us, 
to pray in his name. He says that because he's in heaven advocating for us at the right hand of God, we will do greater things than he did. So this is a sign of his authority over uh, Sabbath and how he has unleashed the Sabbath rest, which is to rest easy in the grace of God for us to go through the whole week. And Jesus is saying, how dare you? Just how dare you? How dare you want to prevent good from happening on the Sabbath? Uh, I just wanted to make sure there was nothing. Oh, I do want to mention a couple of other things. In verse 17, we're told, as he said these things, all his adversaries were put to shame. Take a look at Isaiah 45, verse 16. Isaiah 45, verse 16. Here, um, we're being told about the deliverance God is going to give to his people through an unlikely person who is even referenced as a Messiah, a Messiah, an anointed one, though he was the, uh, the king of the Persians, a, a man by the name of Cyrus. And um, we're told at, at the beginning of chapter 45 that God is going to use Cyrus to liberate his people. But here's the key uh, verse I want you to look at. I don't want to get too lost in the woods there, but I wanted to give you context. Go down to verse 16. <clears throat> all of them, that is the, the people who oppose God, all of them are put to shame and confounded. The makers of idols go in confusion. So the idea here is that Jesus' adversaries are like the adversaries of God's people in Old Testament times who were just baffled by the deliverance given to God's people through this anointed one, this chosen one. And of course, um, Luke is deliberately using this phrasing so that People who know their Old Testament will think, oh, yeah, that's what God did through that anointed one back there. Yes, very good, Ken. You point out that Jesus is the Lord of the Sabbath. That uh, appears in Luke 6, 5, which, which is a way of saying he can do with the Sabbath whatever he wants to do because he's the one who made it. And uh, the ruler of the synagogue, very interesting word, ruler, because here he's facing the king of kings, the true ruler is trying to um, confine Jesus in how he uses the Sabbath. And uh, Jesus says that the Sabbath is for our benefit, not to be a straitjacket for us. So his adversaries were put to shame, as we see uh, the echoes of the language from um, uh, Isaiah 45, 16. They were confused and uh, confounded. And then it says, and all the people rejoiced at all the glorious things that were done by him. Keep in mind, again, how Luke frequently uses that word people. He's talking about people who have come to believe in Jesus in some way. They're not just there to get out of Jesus what they want. This echoes language in Exodus 34, verse 10. Take a look at that. Exodus 34 verse 10. As always, keep your finger in the place we're at. <laughs> Exodus 34 10. And this is at the renewal of the covenant. God said, Behold, I'm making a covenant before all your people, I will do marvels such as have not been created in all the earth or in any nation. And all the people among you, um, who, among whom you are, shall see the work of the Lord, for it is an awesome thing that I will do with you. And so the people here at the synagogue 
are amazed. This resonates then of Exodus 34.10. In, in a way, it's a, it's a way of saying what the disciples say rhetorically when Jesus calms the sea and says, Who is this who even, whom even the wind and waves obey? Who indeed? Who is this? So if you see people reacting to Jesus in the same way that people reacted to God in the Old Testament, the gospel writers are telling you, without overtly saying it, this is God among us. So adversaries uh, put to shame or, or confounded, that's just like God in, uh, uh, in, in terms of uh, what he did to the people of the Sabians and others, the, the people around the people of God reacting to the deliverance that God worked through Cyrus. So we must see an anointed one here like Cyrus. But then he says the people rejoiced and that resonates of Exodus 34, 10, telling us this miracle maker, this sign doer, if you will, is the same God, the people of God rejoiced over in Exodus 34, 10. Now, we're going to have three parables here. Or parablets, snippets of parables that come to us in verse 18, verse 20, and verses 28 to 29. Now, this block of um, uh, things that we're looking at, this is sort of interesting. This is kind of interpreter's commentary. These parables, like so many of the parables, speak of the kingdom of God. And um, oh, just just the overarching structure here of 13, verse 10 to 35. Um, I wanted to wait to give it to you here because now you're going to see it engaged in the parables. But listen to this overview it gives of this section. The section that follows, <coughs> sorry, the section that follows has a twin in chapter 14, verses 1 to 35. Just as chapter 13, 10 to 17 reports the healing of a crippled woman on the Sabbath, so also 14, 1 to 6, relates Jesus' healing of a man with dropsy on the Sabbath. So once again, you have Luke uh, talking about a woman and a man. Notice this time he puts the woman first, and he sometimes put the, puts the man first. But here's the woman first, and then the matching account comes in uh, 14. So we've seen that pattern before. But there's more matching between these two sections. Three parables of the kingdom follow in Luke 13, verses 18 and 19, verses 20 and 21, and 22, verse 30. Similarly, or 22 to 30, rather. Similarly, two units of teaching uh, material on humility, chapter 14, verse 7 to 14, and the banquet of the kingdom, uh, 15 to 24 in chapter 14, uh, follow in Luke. And both chapters end with warnings about the fate of Jerusalem and about the cost of discipleship. So you see, um, Luke is punching this point home as we continue to move toward Jerusalem. We need to understand what the kingdom is like we need to understand what the fate of Jerusalem is. We need to understand how the what the what the what creation's end game is going to be, and we need to understand the cost of discipleship. So he really punches those points home in chapters thirteen and fourteen. So now let's go here uh, to the first of these three parables uh, in verse eighteen. Jesus said, therefore, what is the kingdom of God like? And to what shall I compare it? It is like a grain of mustard seed that a man took and sowed in his garden, 
and it grew and became a tree, and the birds of the air made nests in its branches. Now, mustard seeds were really small. Um, it's been calculated, according to this commentary, that it takes 725 to 760 mustard seeds to make a gram. That's how tiny they are. Yet the mustard seed plant grows to a height of eight to nine. I've seen as much as 10 feet tall. So once again, Jesus is creating a parable that's taken right out of people's everyday experience. They know that mustard seeds are small. They know how large mustard seeds grow. Jesus says this is like the kingdom of God. It's very easy to underestimate. There are many people in the world, maybe most, who underestimate the power of God's kingdom or what it's going to become. It may seem small and pathetic uh, to the world, but for those um, who take refuge in Jesus Christ, they know that the kingdom is such that it it becomes a tree and the birds of the air make nests in its branches. Now, when Jesus uses this term about birds of the air um, being able to make nests in its branches, in other words, we're able to come into the kingdom of God and the birds of the air represent all of the people of many nations who are going to come into this kingdom and take refuge in the kingdom. Uh, this language is used a lot in the Old Testament to speak of the kingdom of God in the world, seemingly humble, seemingly, um, uh, you know, despised and nothing. Uh, Paul talks about this. God um, uh, shames the, the, the wisdom of the wise uh, and he uplifts the foolish, uh, those who are foolish enough to humble themselves to take refuge in this, and that the kingdom is going to be a, a, a vast refuge for all who humbly repent and believe in Jesus, who take up their crosses and follow him. But this imagery is used in the Old Testament uh, about four or five times. Take a look especially at this one. This is one of two instances where this imagery appears in Exodus. Or, excuse me, in Ezekiel, Ezekiel 17, verses 22 to 23. Take a look at that. Ezekiel 17, 22 to 23. Verse 22. Thus says the Lord God, I myself will take a sprig from the lofty top of the cedar and will set it out. I will break off from the topmost of its young twigs a tender one. And I myself will plant that tender one, plant it on a high and lofty mountain. On the mountain height of Israel will I plant it that it may bear branches and produce fruit and become a noble cedar. So what God is uh, talking about here in Ezekiel is the coming of the messianic age, the coming of that age that is, we know is going to come with the day of the Lord when Jesus returns and he fully establishes the new heaven and the new earth, the full establishment of the kingdom of God. What will will have looked um, as just contemptible by the world and of no note and of no importance. God is going to take that little sprig and plant it on a mountain. And it's going to give refuge to everyone who turns to the God we now know in Jesus Christ. So Jesus is employing this Old Testament language. Any one of his original hearers who had heard Ezekiel, and there are passages also in Isaiah that talk about this, 
would have immediately understood the claim that he was making, that he was bringing this kingdom of God into being. And it may look like nothing to you right now. It will look like nothing. <coughs> Excuse me. It will look like less than nothing to you when Jesus is on the cross. And you think that's the utter defeat of his message and of the kingdom of God. Remember what the uh, Cleopas and the other disciples say to the risen Jesus when they're on the road to Emmaus. We had hoped that he had come for the consolation of Israel. There was this feeling of total defeat. But what Jesus is saying is it may look like nothing, but watch. Watch what God does for those who take refuge in him and watch how this kingdom becomes the refuge of Jews and Gentiles who turn to Christ. In the case of the kingdom of God, you cannot measure a book by its cover. You can be in the most beautiful church building you've ever seen in your life. Massive pipe organs and huge choirs and tons of worshipers. And the kingdom of God may not be there. If there are not people there who turn to Christ in repentance and faith, who take up their crosses and follow him, that's not where the church is. On the other hand, you might go to some, uh, you know, uh, a storefront church in the inner city. And the kingdom of God is there because it's filled with people who have turned to Christ. Now, it can be the other way around, too. It's very difficult to measure that from the outside. So Jesus says, don't underestimate what I am doing in people who repent and believe in me. All right. It's and the kingdom starts out small and contemptible and it grows into something enormous. Now look at verse 20. And again, he said, to what shall I compare the kingdom of God? It is like leaven that a woman took and hid in three measures of flour <clears throat> until it was all leavened. Now, you know, leaven is a little bit of dough that you put in with the flour that you are making new bread from in order for the bread uh, to rise. And you just need a little bit of leaven. Now, Jesus uses this leaven imagery in an entirely different way. Back in Luke chapter 12, verse 1, where he warns the, Phar uh, warns the disciples of the leaven of the Pharisees. In other words, don't let their unfaithfulness... Hmm, Enter into your thinking so that unfaithfulness grows among you, right? Now, that You don't want the leaven of the Pharisees. The leaven here that he's talking about is the leaven of the kingdom of God, that good news that all who believe in Christ, we are saved by grace through faith in Christ. That's that leaven of the gospel, that leaven of the kingdom. It just takes a little bit to have an impact on a whole bunch of people and for the kingdom to grow into something amazing. That's why we're called to share the good news uh, with other people. So Jesus can, can use uh, imagery in different ways, just like we do some, uh, sometimes. We, we may talk about uh, something being enormous um, and that being a bad thing at one point, we may speak about something be, being enormous another time, and it's wonderful and good, right? So you, you, context is everything. So Jesus here is talking about the, the kingdom of God. Once again, he's going from small to large. He's, he's saying, don't despise or denigrate or condescend what is little and humble, uh, you know. The last will be first and the first will be last. Now, there's a little shifting of imagery here when we get into verse 22. Um, because he's responding to a question from the crowd. Verse 22. He went on his way through towns and villages, teaching and journeying toward Jerusalem. By the way, this is not only emphasizing <coughs> his physical movement but also 
that this is a part of his continuing journey to the crucifixion. When you see phrases like that in this section of Luke, you know uh, Luke is underscoring that Jesus is headed for crucifixion. And someone said to him, Lord, will those who are saved be few? And he said to them, strive to enter through the narrow door. For many, I tell you, will seek to enter and will not be able. When once the master of the house has risen and shut the door, and you begin to stand outside and to knock at the door saying, Lord, open to us, then he will answer, I do not know where you come from. Then you will begin to say, we ate and drank in your presence and you taught in our streets. But he will say, I tell you, I do not know where you come from. Depart from me, all you workers of evil. I want to stop right there. So Jesus, first of all, says, strive to enter through the narrow door. The word that he uses, this is really interesting. The verb that is translated <coughs> as strive comes over to us from the Greek. And a literal rendering of it would be agonize to enter through the narrow door. In other words, make it your goal to only enter the kingdom through the narrow door. The narrow door, of course, is Jesus. The only way into the kingdom is through Jesus. Don't think that just because we ate and drank in his presence and uh, we heard his teaching, that that means that we're in the kingdom. Because the question is, are we taking up our crosses and following? That's where we're shown whether we trust in Jesus or not. Just to show up for a sermon and just listen, you know, and not hear, huh? and not absorb, and not surrender, and not turn to Jesus in helplessness and faith. Huh? That's what it means to strive to enter the narrow door. Now, be very careful here. This is not works righteousness. This is a striving against all the distractions of the world in order to be focused on Jesus. This is uh, um, refusing to have our attention absorbed so much that we don't focus on Jesus. That's the striving to enter through the narrow door. And this is also athletic language. This is used for athletes who strain, you know, to, to cross the finish line. And it's the very same verb that Paul uses in several very famous passages. Take a look at 1 Timothy 4, verse 10. 1 Timothy 4, verse 10. Paul says, for to this end we toil and strive because we have our hope set on the living God who is the Savior of all people, especially of those who believe. That's what it means to strive to enter through the narrow door, to have our hope set on the living God we know in Jesus, huh? to be focused on that. That's what a good athlete does, to be focused on that end and on no other. And it's not a matter of uh, uh, of our own righteousness. It's being focused on Christ because we know only he has the righteousness that can save us. Take a look also at 1 Timothy 6, verse 12. And this was, a part of this uh, verse was something that uh, uh, my professor, seminary professor and mentor Bruce Shine used to always write on our papers. He says, Paul says, fight the good fight of faith. He's not talking about contending with other people. He's not talking about arguing. He's saying fight to remain focused and well-trained as a disciple like an athlete training for an event. We're training for the last day when we will get to see Jesus face to face. What does that mean? Focusing on Jesus. Fight the good fight of faith. 
take hold of the eternal life to which you were called. In other words, the eternal life is not something I can do. I have to take hold of it. Jesus is reaching his hand out to me, and I'm called to strive to take hold of it. That's entering the narrow door also. And then it says, and about which you made the good confession in the presence of many witnesses. Two other passages, there, one other passage. Uh, 2 Timothy 4, verse 7. 2 Timothy 4, 7. It says, uh, and Paul is, is talking about his own uh, experience as a disciple and how he knows he's coming to the end of his life. <coughs> he says, I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. That's the idea. Strive to enter through the narrow door. Strive to keep following Jesus alone. As Jesus says in Luke 9, verse 23, take up your cross and follow me. Um, and then he says, it's not going to be any good to say, I was on the church roster. The question is, are you following me? Are you focused on me? That doesn't mean you're perfect. That means you know where to turn to, right? And you, you, you routinely turn to him in that lifestyle that we talk about all the time that Luther identified as daily repentance and renewal. And, and <coughs> he says in verse 27 that um, uh, the, the king on the inside, Jesus, is going to say, I don't know you, depart from me. And he says, you're, you're going to go to a place, in verse 28, of weeping and gnashing of teeth. And gnashing of teeth is that, uh, uh, that gritting of your teeth where you say, I blew it. I messed up. How could I have gotten so distracted? Listen, I, I'll give you a good, um, a good synonym for distraction, idolatry. We get distracted by all these little different idols in our lives that we think are going to give us security, peace, hope, wholeness. It can only come from Jesus. Everything else is an idol. There's nothing wrong with possessions. There's nothing wrong with trying to do the best you can for your family. You, we talked about that before. But when they become the end all and the be all and not Jesus Christ, then we're in trouble. Those are distractions. And those distractions can lead us literally into hell hmm? where we grit our teeth because we realize we blew the opportunity to enter the narrow door, blew the opportunity to take hold of the outstretched hand of Jesus Christ who saves us not on the basis of our works, but on the basis of what he does for us. And he says to the Father, he's with me. She's with me. I'm covering them in my righteousness. And he says, you'll see Abraham and Isaac and Jacob and all the prophets in the kingdom of God. He's talking to his fellow Jews. He says, you're going to see all of these patriarchs of the Jewish people. And you're going to see the prophets of God's people in the kingdom but you will be cast out. The word there is ekbalo, thrown out. Um, and in essence, you throw yourself out when you don't turn to Jesus. But yet he also says this in verse 29. And, huh, <clears throat> and people will come from east and west and from north and south and recline at table in the kingdom of God. So he's saying... You Jewish people who are spurning me are going to watch these Gentiles coming from all over the map along with Jews who believe in me. But you're also going to see all these Gentiles who believe in me who believed in the promise the way Abraham believed in the promise. Right. Abraham was not saved for his works, but because he believed in God and his promises. Now Jesus is the fulfillment of all of these promises. And Jews and Gentiles are entering the narrow door. They're trusting the God revealed in Jesus. And those 
Jews and Gentiles, who refuse to follow Jesus, stand outside and they watch these people go in, even though they heard Jesus teaching and they ate with him, maybe even at, at the table of Holy Communion, but they didn't believe. So Jesus says, there'll be a vast throng, but it will all depend on whether you trust in me. And then he says in verse 30, the reversal of fortunes again, and behold, some are last who will be first, and some are first who will be last. That seems like a good place to stop, uh, even though we've got a little bit more in this chapter. We'll pick up, Lord willing, with verse 31 tomorrow night. If you're able to be here, that's great. If not, you know, you can always find the videos on Facebook, on my blog, or uh, on the YouTube channel, the, the, my, my personal YouTube channel. Um, and you can just look it up on YouTube if you want. Some great stuff in here. Let's pray. Father, when we become overwhelmed by things in life, it's easy for us to underestimate the power of your kingdom, the breadth of your kingdom, and how we can take refuge in you. We pray, Lord, that we would be focused on Christ, that we would enter through the narrow door by turning daily to Christ. We know that we uh, are both saints and sinners, in this world. You are not calling us or expecting of us a righteousness we cannot muster, but you give to us a righteousness that comes from you as we live in daily repentance and renewal. Grant, God, that we will take refuge in Christ alone, that we will seek our peace and security and hope from and through Christ alone. And it's in his great name that we pray. Amen. Thank you, everyone. I will plan on seeing you here tomorrow night, Lord willing, and uh, I hope you have a restful night of sleep. Bye now.